my presentation this evening is, um, as has been advertised, is on William Allen, um, a founder of Winona and of Standard Time. Um, those of you in the audience, you, you may know me mainly as the treasurer of the Historical Society and maybe for my work on the Environmental Commission. Um, you may not know what I do in my day job. Uh, I'm actually an electrical engineer. And um, as an engineer, I've really come to respect uh, William Allen's engineering accomplishments. And uh, hopefully that comes through in, in tonight's presentation. So what we're going to go over, um, for, first we'll just uh, go over his family, uh, sort of uh, where he came from. His father actually was an interesting uh, person as well. Uh, we'll say a little bit about him. And then we'll get into the West Jersey Railroad and the founding of Winona. Um, and then um, probably the, the main part of the presentation is about standard time and how that really revolutionized timekeeping, both in America and around the world. And then we'll finish up with his uh, Alan's later life uh, and career uh, after the uh, the institution of Standard Time. So just just a few terms I'd like to define first, uh, that uh, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. First of all, I'm going to be using the term metrologist uh, in this presentation. Metrology is actually the study of measurement. Uh, and it's a different thing than a meteorologist, you know, the type of thing you might see on the, uh, the news. That's the study of the weather. Um, and also just uh, to remind you of the distinction between a scientist and an engineer. A scientist is one who conducts scientific research to advance knowledge, whereas an engineer is one who uses uh, scientific principles uh, to design and build machines and infrastructure and things like that. So let's start out with Alan's family and background. This is uh, William Allen's father, Joseph Allen, Joseph Warner Allen. Um, he was born in Bristol, Pennsylvania, right across the river, Delaware River. Um, Joseph's ancestors, and actually Joseph himself, uh, grew up as a Quaker, uh, but he decided to leave that religion after marriage uh, to become a Protestant Episcopal. Um, his profession was he was a surveyor and a, and a civil engineer, uh, and he worked, I guess, early on in his career on canals. That was sort of the predominant technology of the day uh, when he was a younger person. And later on, he worked on railroads and he, you know, construction of various railroads. He worked, I know, on the uh, Erie Railroad Tunnel uh, up in Bergen, uh, New Jersey. Um, and so he worked both in New Jersey and in other states. He also served as a state senator from Burlington County. Now, at the outset of the Civil War, he was appointed assistant quartermaster general by the governor. And the quartermaster uh, in general is somebody who uh, provisions supplies, uh, but also does recruiting. And in this case, he recruited and commanded the 9th New Jersey Volunteer Infantry, which was a regiment of 1,200 sharpshooters known as the Jersey Muskrats. So you might guess from his death year of 1862 that his Civil War service did not have a happy ending, unfortunately. Um, he and his regiment were sent to Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, to participate in Burnside's expedition. On January 15th, 1862, he had just notified his superiors of the regiment's arrival at Cape Hatteras, and he was returning in a rowboat uh, with three other officers when a wave unfortunately capsized the boat. Uh, Allen and the regiment's chief surgeon, Frederick Weller, were both drowned. Now, his and Weller's bodies were given a state funeral in Trenton, and I think that uh, gives you some idea of, um, you know, the importance uh, of, uh, you know, Allen's service, you know, to the state. Uh, he was buried at Christ Church Cemetery in Bordentown, and the men of his regiment later erected the monument that you see here uh, in his honor. So at the time of his father's death, William Allen was just 16, and he was attending the Protestant Episcopal Academy in Philadelphia. Now, at the end of the school term, he um, needed to support his family, and so he cut short his schooling and went to work as a surveyor. And he, as you can see here on the slide, he worked uh, as a surveyor and engineer on various railroad construction projects around the state. 
Uh, his very first job was on the Camden and Amboy Railroad, which is a, as we'll describe in a minute here, was a pioneering uh, railroad here in New Jersey. So let's talk about the West Jersey Railroad and, and the founding of Winona and William Allen's uh, role in that. So I guess to, um, to understand sort of Winona came, where Winona came from and where the West Jersey Railroad came from, you have to understand a little bit about the um, railroad, how railroads developed in New Jersey. The Camden and Amboy, which is the red line that you sort of see going up here from Camden to uh, Amboy, I guess on the Newark Bay. Whoops, I'm sorry about that. Um, that was started in 1830, which was very early in the U.S. railroad era. It was one of the first railroads really in America. You know, it was started by the Stevens family. Uh, the state granted it a monopoly, basically, on Philadelphia to New York City rail traffic. Um, you know, a portion of the line from Camden to Bordentown, uh, you may know today as the River Line. It's the exact same thing. As far as the West Jersey Railroad, um, the, there were sort of two of them. The first one was chartered also in 1830, uh, but it didn't get started really doing, you know, actively uh, transporting things and operating until 1838. And it only operated in this small segment here that you see here between Camden and Woodbury. Um, it was not a financially successful company. Uh, it had ambitions to certainly build further south, you know, all the way to Cape May, but those were never realized. So then there was a second West Jersey Railroad, uh, which also, you know, had a plan. They wanted to start it at Camden and go to Cape May. Uh, they uh, reused the tracks of the first West Jersey Railroad, and they got started in 1857. Now, they got financial assistance from the Camden and Amboy, um, now, the Camden and Amboy, remember, had that monopoly. Now, they wanted to extend that monopoly. So as one of the conditions of doing that, the state says, well, you have to help out some other railroads in the state. And the West Jersey Railroad was one of those railroads. Um, they only got as far as Woodbury again. Uh, construction south of Woodbury was halted in 1855. And we actually can see some evidence of that in the Winona area, at least in terms of legal records, because the... Uh, the Stonehouse Farm, the oldest uh, residence in Winona, the oldest building in Winona, uh, that changed hands several times. And an 1855 deed uh, for that property mentions that it was adjacent to the contemplated West Jersey Railroad. Wasn't quite there yet. The Millville and Glassboro that you see in green here was organized by some wealthy merchants um, in, Will in Millville and Glassboro who were frustrated by the West Jersey Railroad and they want, wanted to basically connect up to Camden, you know, and, and get connected to the state's rail network. Um, so when the West Jersey Railroad was kind of slow and dragging their feet in that endeavor, they built their own line from, you know, Millville to Glassboro. And that was opened by October 1860. The West Jersey Railroad said that this gap in here in between Woodbury and Glassboro um, you know, it was really no problem for, for local folks. You could just take a stagecoach between the two places. But, you know, a stagecoach, uh, as you can imagine, was uh, uncomfortable for passengers and, and very inefficient for heavy freight. So the Millville and Glassboro, um, you know, basically threatened to extend their line up to Woodbury and, you know, sort of do the West Jersey Railroad's job for it. And the West Jersey Railroad, in response, uh, quickly extended their line south to Glassboro. That extension opened on April 6, 1861. And um, it, that's an interesting kind of historical period because that was just six days before the first shots were fired on Fort Sumter. So uh, this is a, an old map of um, Winona with sort of the uh, modern street grid imposed on it. Um, just to sort of orient yourself, the uh, green line there is Mantua Avenue, modern day Mantua Avenue, and the blue line is the modern day Conrail tracks. So by 1866, the uh, original president and chief engineer, uh, two individuals of the West Jersey Railroad had, had passed away. So the two folks that you see here, Thomas Jones York in the upper right, um, he was uh, appointed as president and down at the lower right, uh, General William Sewell, who was a um, um, 
very decorated uh, hero of world of the Civil War was named as superintendent. Now, the year 1868 was a very eventful year for our story. That's when the Millville and Glassboro was sold to the West Jersey Railroad. And also that year, uh, William F. Allen was hired as the resident engineer of the West Jersey Railroad. Now, sometimes in Winona histories, you'll see that um, uh, William F. Allen is referred to as the chief engineer, but that's really not correct. His title was the resident engineer. Um, one other thing to point out on this map that I'll be describing here, this line, the dark line here off to the left here is the original line of the West Jersey Railroad. And um, it was constructed, as I mentioned, very quickly. And there was this very steep grade uh, here going up to what we know today as Clay Hill. And it was a real operating problem, uh, you know, getting, uh, you know, running the railroad efficiently with that heavy grade. Um, one other thing I'd like to correct, this is actually a, um, an error, also, you'll see it in Marge Lentz's book and some other places. The original line was not narrow gauge. And, um, you know, based on my research, I have been able to find out it was actually a four foot 10 gauge, which is slightly wider than standard gauge. So there are two places in the Winona Trail system today where you can easily see the original West Jersey Railroad route. Uh, on the left here, extending out from the Winona Lake parking lot, uh, you'll notice that the trail is kind of wider and flatter than on most of Winona's trails. And that's because it was the original roadbed of the 1861 West Jersey Railroad. Now the line extended uphill on today's North Jefferson Avenue and then curved back down to meet uh, south today's South Jackson Avenue. If you then walk out to Mantua Creek, you'll encounter the large hill that you see here on the right, known as Clay Hill. And the railroad um, basically uh, constructed Clay Hill so that they could make a bridge across into Mantua Township at this location. And I'd also just like to uh, put my Environmental Commission hat on here and say that the Environmental Commission is in the process of renovating this area of Clay Hill here. So what you see here is some of the original um, um, trail steps and things that Frank Eggert had designed. Uh, those are sort of worn out and we're in the process of replacing those. Uh, we actually have a grant from the Sustainable Jersey and Atlantic City Electric uh, to get that work done. So part of William Allen's job starting in 1869 was undoubtedly to straighten the route of the railroad and to reduce the punishing grade. So this involved making a new track alignment all the way from today's Woodbury Heights, uh, they called it Cooper's Hill then, uh, down into Barnesboro. I think it was roughly three miles. So the photo you see here, a uh, modern day photo obviously, is looking northward along uh, the tracks to Willow Street from Mantua Creek. The embankment that you see here that the railroad is built on, just like Clay Hill, it's not a natural hill. Uh, Allen would have had to acquire this land, you know, from the local farmers and then move it in a massive amount of fill dirt. And that was all done using, you know, the equipment of the time, which was basically, uh, you know, horsepower uh, and a lot, of, uh, a lot of elbow grease, a lot of, uh, a lot of shovels and digging. Now, the new alignment of the West Jersey Railroad bypassed the existing Mantua Station. So what was called the new Mantua Station was constructed uh, in the middle of town, sort of near Stonehouse Farm. Uh, it was actually even closer to the docks at Hannessy's Landing, which were then quite active. On October 10th, 1870, the new alignment opened for traffic. And it was only one track at that time. This is a slightly later photo. Um, uh, when the second track has been installed. The, the train station that we know today uh, was built later on in 1893. So Allen uh, and General Sewell at some point came up with the idea of constructing a suburban town in the sweet potato fields that were Winona. Uh, Allen secured the agreement of seven owners uh, to sell a total of 572 acres of land. So there's a question of what do you do with this land? Well, barely two months after the, the new railroad opened, uh, the new alignment of the railroad opened on December 14, 1870, Allen invited a group of 21 businessmen to his office in Camden to discuss building a new town. 
Now recall that the Millville and Glassboro, that upstart railroad that embarrassed the West Jersey Railroad, um, they uh, had been merged into the West Jersey Railroad. Uh, their former president, Samuel Whitney, a glass manufacturer, uh, prepared a business plan for this new suburban town. And five days later, uh, after that initial meeting, the group of businessmen reconvened in Allen's office in Camden to hear Whitney's proposal. They then boarded a special West Jersey Railroad train that took them down to New Mantua Station to inspect the area. So as a, as a result of those two meetings, the Mantua Land and Improvement Company was chartered by the state and it was organized in February 1871, just a few months later, and it completed those land purchases from the local farmers that I mentioned. Uh, Samuel Whitney, General Sewell, and West Jersey Railroad President Thomas York were among the directors. Uh, Allen ended up being the treasurer of this organization, not its director, but it was really Allen's land and water surveys and his street layout that really got the town started. He really was in effect Winona's first borough engineer. Now the sort of ad that you see here was a later, slightly later ad uh, in 1872. Uh, I'm sorry, the ad that you see here, I think was uh, maybe 1874 or so, several years Earlier in 1872, the railroad had started offering two-year free commuter tickets if you had uh, built a, a house worth over $2,000, and you could get a free three-year ticket on the railroad if your house was worth over $3,000. This is uh, something out of the Historical Society's collection. It's actually the only document we have that has uh, William Allen's writing on it. Um, this is... Uh, just a very ordinary kind of engineering uh, sort of memo from his office in Camden. Uh, it says, please have the enclosed road papers recorded and oblige yours truly, W.F. Allen. And it's written to uh, J.S. Franklin, I think, uh, an attorney. Um, one other interesting thing the, about where Allen's office was, the foot of Bridge Avenue, uh, that's in downtown Camden, obviously, but uh, that area has changed enormously in 150 years. Uh, I think it would be roughly in the area of today's Wiggins Park, uh, where West Jersey Railroad had their ferry and their, their station uh, at the start of their railroad. So this is just an outstanding uh, photograph. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have probably seen it before. It's in the Historical Society's collection. Um, it shows not only the Winona House and some other early houses of Winona, but the, uh, also the two West Jersey Railroad flat cars uh, on what looks to be a siding uh, heading off there into the center of town. Um, I'm not really going to delve any deeper into Winona's early history. I think, uh, as most of you know, um, uh, Marjorie Lentz's book is a great place to, uh, to get that really full story uh, about the founding and development of Winona. I'm just trying to focus here mainly on uh, William Allen's uh, contributions that we're able to document. Uh, one other personal note I'll stick in here about uh, Alan is that he um, married Carolyn York, who was the daughter of the West Jersey Railroad president, Thomas Jones York, uh, and he married her in 1871, so right around the time that uh, Winona was getting started, and at that time he was still working for the railroad. So we're going to move on here uh, to standard time and how that revolutionized timekeeping. So to start out, I'd like to focus a little bit on why is telling time even important in the first place? Why, you know, why, why was that a, a critical thing uh, to, to do? Um, down through history, I think it's been done partly for religious reasons uh, to, you know, set the times of religious services and uh, for example, the, the time of Muslim prayer, uh, and, and also to time things like personal rituals, like meals. Um, what you see here in the slide on the left is maybe the oldest surviving mechanical clock in the world. It's in the Salisbury Cathedral in England, and it was uh, originally built in 1386. And uh, it doesn't actually have a dial that you can see on the outside. It just chimes the hours. Um, but it's, it's one of the oldest clocks, certainly, that we know about today. On the right, you see a German lantern clock dated in 1570. Uh, personal clocks like these were affordable only to the wealthy at that time, 
Uh, notice also that there's no minute hand. It's just, just an hour hand uh, showing you the hour of the day. Now, time was also critically important for accurate sea navigation. Um, mariners could easily obtain latitude using a sextant, like the gentleman in the upper right there. Um, longitude could be determined by astronomers on land using telescopes, but that wasn't really practical on a heaving ship at sea. Um, just as an example of how you could do it through telescopes, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Mason-Dixon line, the border between uh, Pennsylvania and Maryland. Uh, one of the surveyors of that line, Charles Mason, uh, one of his jobs, in addition to the what you might think of as survey work, you know, just um, you know, clearing out, clearing out, and marking the line, he had to basically spend his nights making astronomical uh, measurements to figure out exactly, you know, exactly what longitude he was at. Uh, so that that occupied quite quite a bit of his time uh, when he was make, making those measurements. Now, the challenge of longitude at sea. Uh, spurred several European countries to offer rewards for a method to determine longitude at sea within an accuracy of say 30 miles or better. And the, the problem was not really fully solved until Englishman John Harrison perfected the marine chronometer in the mid 1700s. And that's this device that you see down here in the lower right. Uh, this device could he keep accurate time on long voyages uh, despite the temperature and humidity, humidity variations uh, despite the motion of the ship and even gravitational changes as you went were at different uh, spots on, on the Earth. So that was quite an accomplishment. Harrison's chronometer was what basically enabled lengthy ocean voyages. And I just showed here as an example, Captain James Cook's second voyage, which was to um, the South Pacific Ocean. And uh, it lasted three years, as you can see. And he took one of a copy of one of Harrison's chronometers. And uh, this type of journey just would not be possible unless you were able to accurately determine your position uh, on the earth. Uh, and this enabled also the making of better maps, uh, certainly the mapping of the South Pacific, and even to some extent, the mapping of uh, portions of Antarctica were, uh, that all started around this time. Uh, and were, were, uh, uh, James Cook was the pioneer in those activities. So let's talk about personal timekeeping in, in America in the 18th and early 19th centuries. This was still something done mainly by uh, mostly a thing that the wealthy could do. Um, and these three examples that I've put on the slide here are showing you um, uh, things that you can see at Mount Vernon, which is George Washington's home in Virginia. On the left, the uh, sundial dates to 1765. Um, Sundials uh, show you sun time, and sun time, uh, some of you may not be aware, uh, you can't compare directly to clock time, um, and that's because the Earth's motion around the sun is not a perfect circle, it's actually an ellipse. So um, even back in, in those days, I think you would be able to look up the correction factor in an almanac or, some, or a book or something of that nature. Uh, to figure out uh, what, what the correct clock time was based on what your sundial was telling you. In the center item there is a 1785 French mantle clock. Uh, the owner would have to use a sundial or perhaps the, the chimes in a nearby town uh, to, to set the time on this clock. Um, towns generally in America, uh, at least at this time, set their clocks generally by the sun. Uh, there were not a lot of astronomical observatories or, or folks taking, uh, you know, very detailed scientific measurements to get, uh, you know, super accurate uh, time measurements at that, at that point in, in the country's history. On the right, you have a grandfather clock, which is actually owned by George's half-brother, Lawrence. Uh, George himself did not own the, um, the grandfather clock, uh, but I believe you can probably still see that grandfather clock at Mount Vernon today. Now, in the 19th century, railroads needed accurate time as well for safe passage of trains and to maintain passenger train schedules. Uh, Great Britain's railroads had adopted a single time standard, uh, which was the standard of the Greenwich Observatory back in 1848. Uh, Great Britain was small enough that a single time zone would work for the entire country. 
And matter of fact, sometimes they, uh, in order to get accurate time from place to place, uh, they would take master clocks aboard their trains and, and take them into the next city and you know establish the accurate time there. Now, for America, there were two problems uh, for railroads. How do you transmit your time across the railroad? And then what time do you transmit? The first problem about uh, how to transmit it was largely solved by the time Winona was founded. And we have a clue here in this little uh, pole next to the rail, rail car, and that's the telegraph. The operators used Morse code, the sort of dots and dashes, to send messages between stations along the rail line. And uh, time was among the messages that they were, would transmit. And then it, for folks actually operating the trains, they would carry the best pocket watches available. Uh, for the second problem about what time do you transmit, each railroad mostly adopted the time of its home city. Uh, often an observatory like the Franklin Institute or the U.S. Naval Observatory down in Washington, they kept the time for, the, for uh, their city based on the longitude of that place. Also around this time, Western Union and other companies began renting electrically synchronized clocks. Uh, think about if you're a jeweler selling um, you know, not just personal timepieces, but also, uh, you know, grandfather clocks and mantle clocks. How do you get accurate time? Well, Western Union had a solution to that problem uh, starting right around this, this time uh, in the 19th century. But this really didn't address the problem of the um, having different time standards across the entire country. And we'll show you what, what a big problem that was. Now, we're going to uh, come back to William Allen's career. In 1872, he left the West Jersey Railroad to become assistant editor and then editor of the Traveler's Official Guide, which was then published in Philadelphia. It was a monthly compendium of all things railroad and steamship related. You had timetables and maps, lists of officers, advertisements from everything from locomotives to ticket punches. Um, Allen, uh, when he took, uh, took over his, uh, in his editorship, started publishing a list of all the 71 American Railroad time standards. And you can see them uh, here around the, the sides of the cover, the top of the cover. Uh, and I have a portion of them blown up here. What this is showing you is when it's 12 noon in Washington, uh, it's 12.07 in Philadelphia, 11.48 in Pittsburgh, 11.54 in you know, Port Hope, Canada. And, and you get the idea. Basically every town had their own idea of what the correct time was. So uh, for both travelers and railroad officials, dealing with all these various time standards was a serious inconvenience. Uh, starting in 1875, Allen was elected as general secretary of two industry associations uh, that were uh, basically sorting out time issues when a train was handed off you know, from one railroad to another. And they also coordinated when railroads would issue their seasonal timetables each year. Uh, despite his sort of abbreviated education, uh, Allen uh, was a very good writer, and he was turning into a metrologist, again, somebody who was, you know, studying uh, measurements of things. So, um, just a moment here. Okay. It's, it's not really correct to say that William F. Allen had all the answers on how to get out of this mess. Um, as early as 1869, this man, Professor Charles Dowd, had tried to convince railroad officials of the need to move to a standardized system of timekeeping, uh, even if cities didn't want to adopt the new system. But the, uh, the railroads in the U.S. government were generally receptive, but nobody really wanted to make the first move. Uh, then in 1873, there was a general business depression across the whole country, and that pretty much ended discussions for the time being. So starting in the late 1870s and the early 1880s, a number of prominent scientists were proposing solutions to the time problem. Uh, some were, you know, similar to Dowd's attempts that you see here. Some of them wanted a single time zone for the entire country. Um, you know, some had other ideas, but um, railroads were basically rapidly expanding by this time. Um, railroad managers really had, uh, were, they had their hands full just running their railroads and they didn't have a lot of time or patience, you know, to listen to academics and academic solutions to problems. In 1881, one of these scientific papers was presented to the General Time Convention, that industry association I mentioned that William Allen was the secretary of. 
And so the railroad officials instructed Allen to prepare a, a report on the time problem and the potential scientific solutions. So the following spring, Allen solicited further comment in his Traveler's Official Guide in an editorial. And so after reading the responses, Allen decides to come up with his own proposal. His office was in New York City by this time, and he actually worked on this plan on his daily train commute between South Orange and New York City. Uh, by studying the existing railroad time standards, um, he basically uh, arrived at the same four hour based regions that Dow did, uh, and also some of the scientists were proposing. But Allen claimed that these regions made railroad sense, regardless of what the scientists thought of it, whether it was scientifically valid or not. Um, and the map that you see here is basically the one that Allen himself drew up uh, to explain his proposal. It also shows his choice of uh, time zone names, which are the same ones we use today, Eastern, Central, you know, Mountain, and Pacific. The, um, the longitude lines, you can sort of see a little bit at the, the top here, um, at 75, 90, 105, and 120 degrees, uh, they'd been proposed before by scientists. The numbers are relatively simple to explain. Uh, you take the 360 degree circumference of the earth, you divide by 24 hours in a day, and you get 15 degrees per hour. And you have to pick an origin point. So again, they, they chose uh, Greenwich, England at the Royal Observatory. Uh, turned out nautical maps had used this notation for uh, almost 100 years at this point. So it made sense that you would use this for time zones also. Now what's really unique about Allen's plan versus the earlier ones is how he divides up the regions. Allen used railroad division points, places where they changed crews or where they handed off trains between companies. Um, sometimes this meant in some cities like Pittsburgh and Buffalo, the time zone boundary was right in the middle of a railroad station. But um, in each case, the time difference at those places was always exactly an hour, not some random number of minutes. So I think we can see here the benefit of Allen's time in the railroad industry. Uh, unlike the scientists, he's able to come up with a proposal that he knows will be acceptable to the railroad managers. So Allen presented his plan to the meetings of the General and Southern Railway Time Conventions in April 1883, and he contrasted his plan, standard time plan, with the existing practices, which he called hard scrabble time. And he believed that the general public would accept the standard also, uh, saying in his report that, quote, local time would be practically abolished. So the railroads at the two meetings unanimously voted to adopt his standard, but they were only 10% of the railroad companies that were in the U.S. and Canada at that time. And they delegated the task of convincing the other 90% of the companies to Allen himself. Allen decided to wait until late August to start campaigning, which was just weeks before the fall meeting of those two time conventions. And as Allen said, quote, I decided the battle, if it was to be won, must be short, sharp, and decisive. Um, so letters, and you see here in this uh, slide here, the, uh, the sort of uh, the beginning of the message that Allen sent out to all these railroad officials. So the responses, the letters and the telegrams came pouring into Allen's office. Many of them supported the plan, but some had questions and some had, had objections. Allen says he wrote 510 letters, 100 telegrams, and distributed thousands of maps and circulars uh, during this uh, short adoption campaign uh, that, that late summer and fall. At the two fall meetings of the time conventions in October, the railroads overwhelmingly voted in favor of adopting Allen's standard time, and they wanted it to take effect at a schedule change time in November. So that leads us to the day of two noons. Allen had successfully convinced most railroads to make this switch. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, Allen really wanted the general public to adopt his new standard also. He wanted to get rid of these local times everywhere, not just on the railroads. So he set about to lobby um, astronomical observatories. He lobbied mayors. He lobbied telegraph companies in major cities. And he basically wanted all the public uh, clocks, but also uh, things known as time balls that you see a picture of here. Uh, he wanted all those things to operate on standard time. And a time ball basically is operates by the same principle as the ball that you see in um, Times Square on New Year's Eve. Uh, but in those days, a time ball was a vital service for ship's navigators 
in port cities, and it allowed them to set their marine chronometers, uh, which as I explained earlier, it allowed them to determine longitude accurately once they were out to sea. So the railroads picked uh, Sunday for the transition because the fewest trains would be running on that, on that time. And they carefully issue orders to their employees telling them when and how to adjust their watches. The train crews also were instructed to uh, stop at the next uh, stop after the time change and to verify their watches against the, uh, the clock that the telegraph operator would be keeping at that next station. Uh, newspapers of the day described the general public as being a little bit uh, bewildered, I would say, by the change. Um, you can imagine changing, changing time or changing clocks could be, uh, could be disruptive to people. Um, many public officials, they supported the change, but a few of them felt the change was sort of going against the natural order of things. Uh, they opposed the plan. Uh, as I'll demonstrate in a moment, places in the eastern half of each zone actually did have two noons. Uh, clocks had to either be temporarily stopped or moved backward on this, on this day of two noons. Places in the western half of each zone had to move their clocks ahead to catch up with the new standard. So um, Winona, as it turns out, is just eight, eight miles west of the 75th meridian, which is the center of the eastern time zone. Um, if you were the manager of the Winona House uh, Hotel on that day of two noons, and if you were a stickler for accurate time, you would need to set your hotel clock and your pocket watch 36 seconds faster to conform to the new standard. And since Winona was a railroad town, it very likely fell in line with the West Jersey Railroad, which was by then controlled by the giant Pennsylvania Railroad. So uh, cities on the edge of the time zones, you can think of like places in Maine or maybe Pittsburgh or Buffalo, they would have had to make much larger corrections up to a half hour or so. So after the day of two noons, and, and we have most of the railroads in America now successfully on our new time standard, um, there was a uh, Meridian Conference held in Washington, D.C. to resolve some international scientific uh, disputes or basically establish some standards that had been uh, not standardized up to that time. Um, they made several decisions that I list here. One of the, the most important ones, ones was basically to fix the prime meridian at Greenwich, England, again, along that line of the Royal Observatory. And um, that was, uh, at this time, a de facto standard for sea charts, for British railway time, and for, the, obviously, the standard time in the United States as well. They also determined that the, uh, the longitude lines would be numbered from east to west, so starting at zero and, and increasing. Um, they decided that the day would begin at midnight. And you would think, well, doesn't everybody begin their day at midnight? Well, no, actually astronomers didn't. They typically began their day at noon because they were making observations at night and uh, they didn't want to interrupt their observations to think about, oh, it's a different day now. So they, uh, they, they had to be convinced uh, to start their days at midnight. Al, uh, William Allen was one of the U.S. delegates, and he uh, argued that standard time should be adopted really for civilian uses, uh, whereas um, keeping a universal time, there are some scientists who basically said there should be one time or one time zone for the entire world. Uh, Allen said that those uh, that universal time should be reserved just for science and for international communications, which in those days was pretty much just the telegraph. And pretty much that's, that's what happened. Uh, as, you, as you know, we use time zones today, uh, computers and, you know, for scientists and airline pilots and things like that, they do use the concept of uh, UTC or Greenwich Mean Time. You'll, you'll hear those terms. That's basically universal time. So Alan had done a great job building consensus, but the, uh, among the railroads and some of the cities, but the U.S. government itself didn't really mandate time zones until World War I. The Standard Time Zone Act of, or Standard Time Act of 1918, adjusted the time zone boundaries, uh, as they're shown here, and also they instituted daylight savings time. Uh, daylight savings time was repealed after the war; it was viewed as sort of a wartime measure. It returned again temporarily during World, during World War II, um, and then only in 1966 did it become something more than a wartime measure and more of an every, you know, a typical uh, every, every day or every year uh, occurrence in America. 
Um, in the last several years, there are actually some efforts underway in several states and in Congress to observe daylight savings time year round. Um, that's, you know, partly uh, folks I think are concerned about the disruptions to people's uh, circadian rhythms and body clocks, um, and as well as just the general hassle of, you know, changing clocks twice a year. And there are also some advocates really for keeping uh, standard time all year round. Um, uh, and they cite things like reduced energy usage. They have some studies that, that sort of show that. So let's talk a little bit about Alan's later life and career and some of the other things he did. His contribution to railroad standards basically didn't end with standard time. Uh, the two time conventions that I mentioned earlier that he was secretary of, they merged in 1886 and they began working on safety standards for railroading, like uh, how you issue orders over a telegraph, uh, how you give a hand signal, and how you would use uh, automatic signals to you know, make trains move more safely. Uh, Allen remained in his position as the secretary of this committee and also its successor organization that you see here, the American Railway Association. Uh, he stayed involved with numerous professional societies, and this was all in addition to his day jobs as the editor of the Traveler's Official Guide, and he also got into other businesses such as fire alarm companies. And he would maintain the, you know, basically pivotal roles in the railway industry for the rest of his life. I haven't said much about his personal life so far, so I think it's probably worth saying a few things about that. Um, he and his wife Caroline lived in three places in, in their, uh, during their marriage, up in Bordentown, uh, where Alan had been born, uh, in Montclair and also in South Orange. And the, the home that you see here is the one that they built new in 1886 in, in uh, South Orange. Uh, they had four sons, uh, three of whom were born in Camden and one of whom was, the last was born in South Orange. Um, William was very active in the civic life of South Orange. Uh, I think he was, uh, I think it was uh, known as a trustee of, of the town. Uh, he also founded something called the Meadowland Society, which was, I think, something seemed like a cross between a private club and a homeowners association. So you know, he was very active uh, you know, in the civic life uh, in, in South Orange. We can get sort of a glimpse into his personal life by this 1900 passport application. Uh, at that time, he was 53 years old. He was five foot, ten and a half inches tall with gray hair. And he was proposing to go abroad with his wife and his 19-year-old son, John, for up to six months. Uh, based on what I've seen of his professional responsibilities, he certainly deserved a vacation. <laughs> so, uh, Alan died in, uh, at age 69 in 1915 at his home in South Orange. Uh, he's buried here in this plot in a cemetery in Orange. Uh, his wife, Carolyn, passed away over 20 years later in uh, 1937. There are at least two memorials to Allen that I'm aware of, uh, public mem memorials, I should say. Uh, this one is on the former Bordentown City Hall building. It's uh, dedicating the clock tower uh, in his memory. Uh, Bordentown, you know, was his, his hometown, and uh, they're, they're proud to have him. And the plaque that you see here is in Washington, D.C.'s beautifully restored Union Station, uh, railroad station, in case you don't know. Um, the, uh, I won't read the entire dedication here, but it says in part, by his zeal, wisdom, devotion, and integrity, he won a commanding position in the administrative councils of American Railways. This tablet is erected in memory of his life and services by the American Railway Guild, of which he was a founder. And you can see uh, here are these five clocks or the five zones that he uh, were part of his standard time plan, set exactly an hour apart, and always with the uh, Washington, D.C., Eastern Time, uh, being at noon. So uh, that's pretty much it. I'd just like to uh, give a thanks, a uh, shout out to Larry Smith and Lou McCall and Bob Thomas. Uh, they all helped me in uh, various ways with this presentation with uh, some suggestions and materials and, and books. So um, that, is, that is the end of my presentation. So thank you very much.